In order to understand the trend in first ionisation energies across period two and three, it's first of all quite useful to make a bit of a prediction using the Bohr model of the atom. So let's draw a graph with the ionisation energy, or the first ionisation energy on the y-axis, and the elements in period two, in this example, along the x-axis. In order to predict the pattern in first ionisation energy, it's useful to have a definition for first ionisation energy. So here is the IB definition. First ionisation energy is the amount of energy required to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of gaseous atoms. Put simply, we are taking an electron from an atom. And you'll need to be able to represent this in a general equation that looks something like this, where I'm starting with one mole of gaseous X atoms, and after ionisation, I now have X plus ions and electrons. So let's now use the Bohr model to try and predict the general trend in first ionisation energies for period two elements. And it's going to be useful here to write down the electron arrangements for these elements to help with our predictions. You'll notice here that all of these elements have a full first energy level with two electrons. And as I go across the group in the second energy level, they are gaining one electron. Now, because their outer electrons are all going into the second energy level, they are all experiencing the same electron shielding from the two electrons in the first energy level. So now let's consider the number of protons in the nucleus of each element. I'll represent a proton with the symbol P+. Plus. So you can see that the number of protons increases by one every step across the periodic table that I move. And because my outer electrons, all in the second energy level, and therefore all experience the same shielding from the nucleus, but the number of protons is increasing as I go across my period, I would expect it to become progressively more difficult to take away one of those valence or outer electrons. So my prediction using the Bohr model for first ionisation energies is going to look something like this. And the general trend shown here is true of actual ionisation energy data, but there are some exceptions that we need to be able to explain. So the actual first ionisation energy data collected from experiments looks something like this. So the general trend that I'll put in red here is still increasing, but there are exceptions that we need to explain. And in order to explain these two exceptions, we're going to use the atomic orbital model of the atom and write down the electron configurations to help us out. Let's start by comparing lithium and beryllium. And because we're considering how difficult it is to remove the outer electron, let's highlight that outer electron in the electron configuration. And we can see here that for lithium and beryllium, the outer electron is in both cases in the 2s sublevel. So why is it that beryllium has a higher first ionisation energy? Well, as we discussed before, beryllium has one more proton than lithium, so there'll be more electrostatic attraction between the nucleus and the outer electrons. Therefore, it's more difficult to remove. So we see an increase in first ionisation energy. Let's now consider beryllium and boron. And this is one of our first, well, this is the first exception in our general trend of increasing ionisation energy. So we need to explain why there is a dip from beryllium to boron, when normally we might expect it to have increased again. So looking at my outer electrons, the outer electron in beryllium is in the 2s sublevel. However, in the boron atom, the outer electron is in the 2p sublevel. And given that the 2p sublevel is a higher energy sublevel than the 2s sublevel, we can treat it as being further from the nucleus. And in this case, being further from the nucleus is decreasing the electrostatic attraction between that electron and the nucleus. So it actually becomes slightly easier to remove than that in beryllium. So even though boron has one more proton than beryllium, it, clearly the experimental data shows that the 2p sublevel is 
far enough away to impact the electrostatic attraction between the electron and the nucleus. So what happens between boron and carbon? Well, as is true of our general trend, we see an increase in first ionization energy. And if I look at the electron configuration, I can see that the outer electrons are both in the 2p sublevel. So in this case, the higher ionization energy for carbon must be caused by the extra proton it has in the nucleus. An extra proton in the nucleus means more electrostatic attraction to those outer electrons, so it's more difficult to take that electron away from the atom. From carbon to nitrogen, we see the same thing again. The outer electron is also in the 2p sublevel, but nitrogen has one more proton than carbon, so the greater electrostatic attraction makes it more difficult to remove that electron. We then come to the second exception that we need to be able to explain. In order to do so, it's now going to be important to draw an orbital box diagram for the 2p sublevel in nitrogen and oxygen and see if we can use that to explain why it's now easier to remove an electron from oxygen compared to nitrogen. So in the 2p sublevel for nitrogen, I need to draw three electrons. And for oxygen, I need to draw four electrons. So considering which electron is going to be removed from the nitrogen, it actually doesn't really matter. There's three electrons in identical situations. However, for the oxygen atom, you'll notice that in one of the p orbitals, I actually have a pair of electrons. And given that electrons have a negative charge, I would expect there to be some electrostatic repulsion between those two electrons. And this means that to remove one of those electrons is actually going to be slightly easier than expected because there's already an unfavorable force occurring between them in that orbital. So we can explain the slight dip in ionization energy for oxygen by describing the electrostatic repulsion between paired electrons in an orbital. So even though oxygen has one more proton than nitrogen, clearly this repulsion is the more important factor to consider when explaining the experimental data. Following oxygen, we see our continued general trend of increasing ionization energy meaning that the increasing number of protons in the nucleus is clearly having a greater effect on the ionization energy compared to any repulsion between electrons in orbitals. So as a brief summary of the key points here, the general trend in first ionization energy across a period is increasing. And there are two exceptions we need to explain. The first exception is between the group two and group three element, beryllium and boron in this case. And here we see a dip in the ionization energy because the outer electron is now in a P sublevel instead of the S sublevel. And this means because the P sublevel is further from the nucleus or higher energy that it feels less electrostatic attraction from it. This would also explain the drop between magnesium and aluminium in period three. The second set exception we need to explain is between the group five and group six elements or nitrogen and oxygen in this example. And we explain this decrease due to repulsion between paired electrons in a p orbital. And this means that removing one of those electrons is slightly easier than we might expect. And that was how we explain the general trend and the two exceptions in period two and three on the periodic table. Hopefully this video is of some help.